Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. We are going to get started here in just a couple minutes. Um, but as we are kind of kicking off here, let us know who you are. Introduce yourself in the chat. Um, like I said, we're going to get started here in just a couple minutes. Um, if you've never been to a mini AMA before, um, this is this is what we got. We have an awesome accessibility series with our friends at Accessible 360 that you'll get to hear a lot from. Um, but AMAs are monthly, twice monthly virtual interactive education series. Um, we're joined by subject matter experts and to answer your questions in real time. Um, my name is Maria Plussell and I'm the executive director of Ministar. And so we put on events like mini AMA um, in the before times. It was a lot of like thousand person free tech nerding out events. Um, so now obviously we, we pivoted to virtual, um, but we're really excited for the series. We're excited for this session. Very, very timely as we kick off the new year, accessibility practices to implement in 2021. So um, if you are new to Crowdcast as well, um, you'll notice that there's two functionalities that we'll be using today. So there's the chat. Um, like I said, let us know who you are, that you can hear us okay. That's always important. Um, and then there's also, if you look down at the bottom, there's the ask a question feature. And we'll be monitoring both of those as we go along. We'll, we'll start off the conversation um, with a little bit of more of a presentation style, and then we will dive into live Q&A with all of your questions. So right away, whenever you have questions, um, you don't have to wait until that point drop them in either ask a question or in the chat, and we'll get to them um, for that component of it. Hey, Katie and Carolina. Um, <coughs> he is from South Minneapolis. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Um, <laughs> fantastic. All right. Well, we, hey, Aaron. <laughs> um, I'm actually going to kick it off to Michelle. Um, Michelle's going to kind of introduce our amazing speakers that we have today and a little bit about what we'll be talking about. So Michelle, why don't you kick it off? Great. Thank you. Hello to everyone and happy 2021. Um, we can say that I typically say that um, all month long when the calendar finally clicks over. So um, I'll be saying that for about another three weeks. Jason Webb, um, who is one of my co-speakers today, who's a developer advocate at A360, just said to me, uh, we've only been at 2021 about a week and a half. Uh, seems like a month already. So uh, my name is Michelle Landis. I'm a co-founder at A360, Accessible 360. We are normally located in Uptown in Minneapolis. Um, Jason still is, um, but we're all working from home as well. Joining me today then um, speaking is Jason Webb, our developer advocate advocate and also Nick Bade. He's the senior accessibility engineer here at A360. And we're here to give you um, a little bit of a forum to discuss best practices going into 2021. One of my highest and best uses is to talk a little bit about the risk mitigation strategies. I work with a lot of the top ADA defense attorneys um, and alongside my services team and executing uh, lots of things that in regards to both compliance and also usability. And so Jason and Nick will walk through a couple of those. I'm gonna talk for a little bit about some of those strategies and then I'm gonna turn it over to the tech guys so they can dive into some specific things um, and then open it up for QA. So Jason or Nick, I just wanted to offer, do you wanna say anything in the opening remarks? And okay, if not. <laughs> no, I think you covered it, that's perfect. Good to go. Nick, are you good? Okay. All right. Well, again, um, I'm just going to cover a couple of quick things. Um, and Jason, if you could advance to the, the next slide, I'll talk about some, some holistic risk mitigation strategies. If any of this is a repeat, if any of you have heard this before from A360, please type in a question. Uh, Maria will help us uh, get to those. And I want to make sure that we dive as deep as you want to in each of the topics that we're talking about today. So number one, if you have a website, um, if you have a place where you can fit an accessibility statement, and I'll talk about where to put it in mobile apps in just a second. In an accessibility statement on a website, um, there's a simple formula that we've successfully used at A360 that includes an opening statement in your brand's voice that says, we want to welcome everybody. We're an inclusive place. We want to make sure that everybody can interact with our digital products 
access um, our goods and services, purchase them, find out about them, and so on. Um, an accessibility statement is typically indicated in the footer of a website, but not always. You can sometimes, if you'd like to, put a link to it in the beginning, like right after the skip to main content, you could program a link to your accessibility statement so it is also read. But in general, here's my recommendation, which is not legal advice, but just our subject matter expertise opinion. You should open with a brand statement that says, we want to offer inclusivity to all. We've taken some actions. In that section, I would keep it short. I would say we're working with an independent provider. We've you know, taken some um, actions, even just that as a general statement, we're working on this. Second of all, if you're looking for help and you're using assistive technology for accessibility assistance, if you will, here's a phone number that you can call to get help if what you're interacting with isn't quite there yet for you, or here's an email. And the whole goal there is to make sure that you have a way for people with disabilities that might not be um, able to interact with all elements, a place to call or a place to email to get help in the services that they need. Um, you might also uh, consider um, a corporate accessibility uh, policy for inclusion. Um, we recommend these for larger organizations, but certainly any corporation of any size could implement these. A really nice uh, fresh start to the year. And it would be to not only think about your websites, your mobile apps, your web apps, or your digital properties, but also think about your HR inclusion process. Are you using meeting share services that are accessible? When you're doing uh, PowerPoints, um, are you using the best practices for accessible PowerPoints and things like that. Um, I'll talk a little bit more on a different slide later um, about hiring people with disabilities. But in this section about corporate policy for inclusion, please think about things like, are we posting on um, HR portals that are fully accessible or offer usability for people with disabilities? Have you tested them? After the application process is done, have you looked at your onboarding? Are your benefits information, uh, stuff about your 401k and healthcare and dental, are those being provided in an accessible format? Things like that. And then on to working with somebody with disabilities in your organization. Are you using inclusive uh, practices and platforms internally? So um, another area for risk mitigation, looking at the new year coming, would be audits. Are you getting audits done? Are you testing your digital products? And, and like I said before, Jason and Nick are going to talk a lot more about those technical aspects in a moment. If VPATs are a part of your world, a VPAT is a voluntary product accessibility template. If you're selling your platforms or those that you're working on for clients, if you're selling those to government, healthcare, or uh, medical, um, or public education, please consider um, uh, taking a fresh look at your VPAT process. It might include using a third party vendor to do your VPATs um, or to dig in a little bit deeper, get some more information about how you've been providing those. Again, for those that haven't come across those, often used in RFP, RFQ, RFI processes for Title II entities, which by the ADA are defined as the government itself, healthcare, or public education. So again, if you're selling into it, you might come across it there. Um, new site builds. If you're looking at building anything new, new site, new app, new anything this year, bring accessibility, shift left, bring accessibility into the beginning practices of it. And again, we'll dive into some best uh, ideas for that later. The last two risk mitigation topics I wanna talk about real quick are the CCPA and the UNRWA Civil Rights Act. They both have to do with California. Um, if your products are viewed digitally in the state of California, the recommendations that went forward for 2021 for the California Consumer Privacy Act include a requirement of Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, WCAG 2.1 Level AA. So again, the guys will talk a little bit about those cookie notifications, how to make sure that they're 2.1 uh, compliant, but that's a very important thing to be watching out for. And the UNRWA Civil Rights Act, I want to touch on this real briefly again because it's gaining some steam out there. And my one of my uh, you know hopes is to convey uh, not only the um, the real reason why we want to do this is to be accessible, but I also want to let you know what's out there on the horizon for litigation. Many of the plaintiff attorneys, and when I say plaintiff attorneys, I'm typically referring to high volume plaintiff attorneys, right? Those that file a lot of cases. They file them in federal district courts 
And they also file them additionally in the states of New York and California at really, really high numbers. And in California, they're using the UNRWA Civil Rights Act, which is a California state law, which, offer, well, which offers or provides for a $4,000 penalty for an access violation. And what we've seen out there in the field is this. A plaintiff or a plaintiff's firm will have a plaintiff access a website, say in June, in July, in August, they'll log those. And then when they go to file suit um, or send a demand letter, they're going to include requirements of that UNRWA Civil Rights Act. And they'll state that they've been uh, um, not able to access it on all of those. Where that comes into play is these have been in lawsuits for a very long time, about a year and a half, because so few companies actually um, fight this stuff and, and instead of settle it or litigate it right away, those that have gone on um, in the litigation process, there have been rulings by judges and those penalties are being enforced. It also provides that the defendant has to pay the attorney's fees. So um, that's what I wanted to cover here. Jason, can you move to the next slide for me real quick? And um, we'll talk about creating an accessibility statement uh, with a roadmap. Again, a little bit deeper dive into the accessibility statement. As you can see here, uh, the team recommends that you invite your customers to help in reporting issues. Um, we have an idea of compensating them for their labor. I'm gonna let Jason talk about that. Um, uh, and also, if your site isn't fully accessible today, create a public roadmap that commits uh, to specific actions by specific dates and then follow through and share these updates. Now, um, we've talked a little bit about internally here at A360. Um, Anything that is up on the screen uh, or that is being recommended should definitely be run past your legal team. Um, Jason and I can discuss with you guys where these different recommendations are coming from. Uh, mine personally is gonna be that you keep things very succinct and very light. Um, when you put specifics out there, um, some attorneys will feel that it will make you a, more of a target and then when Jason takes over, I'll allow him to, to share why, uh, why that recommendation is in there, where that be best practice has come from in his opinion. And then the next slide, Jason, I think talks about hiring. Yeah. So this is where I'm gonna transition um, over to Nick and Jason. Um, and again, A360 is a mission-driven organization. We employ a high number of employees that have disabilities. Um, it's important to our work. It's important to every organization's work, in our opinion. So don't just hire them as an accessibility specialist in SMEs, expecting them to transform your company. Hire them for what they are qualified for, and then let them do their job and be part of your culture. And what we're saying here is, and again, Jason, I'll let I'll invite you to to comment on uh, these bullet points, but. When you're looking to fill a job, don't assume that somebody with a disability can't do the job. Make sure that you have accessible ways for them to apply and make sure that you're looking for that practice of inclusion. Um, Jason, this is a great place for you maybe to take over on the last two we're talking here about. Don't make accessibility just another requirement, right? Teams can become desensitized um, and they can put it on their back burner. That goes with anything in compliance, right? If it's a list or a, you know, a checklist that you've got to go through, it feels different than if you create a culture for inclusivity. This is a little bit hard sometimes in organizations. We may be delivering this message to people who need to have the C-suite and other things um, influence this, right? But the more, more that you can do as internal champions to create an environment for inclusivity, um, we feel it's in the best interest of your organization. Yeah, exactly, Michelle. I, this is this is really all about um, observations and, and discussions that I have had with uh, people on social media and being kind of plugged into the accessibility consulting and ad advocacy space um, that there's, you know, there's this kind of image that we as people from outside that community might have where we say, oh, people that have disabilities, they're going to come over, they're going to transform our company. And um, that's what we need to hire them to do. And you know what? Some do. Some absolutely do. That that can happen but that shouldn't really be an expectation for all people with disabilities. Um, and for me, as someone who works as a developer on production teams, um, you know, if there's a, another director that has to come in from the side and I have to you know, do a little bit of extra work for, that's different than if another developer or a designer or a tester 
who's sitting on kind of my area of the uh, the org chart uh, that I take coffee breaks with, that I you know get to know personally, if they're struggling to use that thing that I just built, um, that makes me feel it much differently than oh, I got to fulfill this requirement. Um, and obviously that's not to say that we should not have uh, those kinds of checklists and requirements. Um, those things are good because processes are important. Um, but you know, this is a great way to make those kinds of requirements uh, a lot easier to achieve and more integrated into the actual process, the day-to-day -day process. So they don't feel like, oh, this is another thing we have to do and we'll fit it in. Maybe we'll negotiate at the end and try try to do a little bit less than what we wanted to. Well, if there is somebody that needs it and you know them personally, you're going to be a lot less uh, likely or you'll have a much easier time um, justifying, hey, I need to spend time making this work because so-and-so uh, needs to be able to use this. It's a lot more impactful. Um, so Michelle, you mentioned a couple of slides back, uh, kind of covering back on what you had mentioned, the, the points there. Again, coming from uh, just watching a ton, as a developer advocate, I am plugged in quite a bit to that consulting and advocacy space from that technology perspective. Um, and I do see a lot of frustration from people um, that are technically savvy and also maybe they use a screen reader or their keyboard and they feel like they're having to do this work that should have been done already and then do it for free. <laughs> so they're, you know, it's one thing to just say, oh, I have one problem, I'll make one email, one complaint. But if you have a, a permanent or a chronic disability, that's a permanent part of your life, you know. They may be encountering issues for many sites all the time. And you can imagine that if they're constantly having to just make space for themselves and ask for uh, accommodation, um, that, that can be pretty frustrating. Um, so one idea that I've heard floated from some of these people is, um, hey, if, if the consequence of this is a potential settlement or a lawsuit or some sort of business ramification, maybe you can use that logic as a justification and say, um, hey, we need your help to find these issues in addition to this statement that we are doing our best. Um, and maybe there's a bounty or some sort of a gift card or a discount saying, hey, thank you for, for doing that, that work and pointing out something for us. Uh, is there anything else on this slide? I think, Michelle, you talked about a roadmap, and I think your advice definitely supersedes mine. Uh, this is, again, just kind of um, a, a more broad observation that I think you are, are closer to, um, that when you, know, when you have those roadmap dates, the important thing is that those are, are genuine and they're real. And when you follow through on them, um, you know, it, it's, it's easier to say, hey, we have a trajectory. We actually are putting in effort and you can't go to like, you know, the web archive and find the same statement from two years ago and nothing's changed. Um, it's just nice to show that you're actively engaged somehow. And there's definitely a balancing act to talk to with your leadership and le legal teams to figure out how much detail is appropriate to, to show that effort. Yeah, and again, based on your corporate uh, lawyer, um, their desires for privacy statements, their desire and their comfort level with disclosure. What Jason's talking about is sometimes companies will put a date on their accessibility statement. Um, a lot of attorneys that I network with and that we do work for would not suggest that. Um, because if you forget to update it, then it seems like you haven't done anything in two years, but that's not necessarily the case. So again, always, always, always talk to your own legal team and do what they recommend. Um, loop in compliance and, and loop in digital so everybody's on the same page. One recommendation that I can add to this uh, group of ideas as far as how to get this going in a company or how to get it going into a client company um, is that there we've always suggested for a long time that accessibility coordinator be a job description that maybe you add to somebody in one of your lead tech teams it may be in a bigger organization that you have an accessibility committee and in those we'll see your organizations take somebody from legal somebody from tech uh, like cio cto somebody on the front lines hopefully right somebody that's actually implementing the work um so vp of digital 
um, you know, webmaster, any of those titles that, that work, but have people from cross disciplines focusing on the accessibility and always somebody from HR. So that's another one that I would add in there, Jason, that um, I think as I've been listening to us have our own conversation that I would definitely say is a good idea. Examples of these conversations of these, please reach out if you need some help. I'm happy uh, to talk offline or answer any questions in the chat. Thanks, Jason. Yes, yeah, awesome. Um, so a product that uh, an, an, another area that we want to talk about is, you know, something that is pervasive in every size of company is the way you do work. So SDLC, that was a new term for me at my last couple jobs, uh, the software development life cycle. Um, some places that's a very strict, gigantic flow chart, but in other places, it's more of a concept. It's a natural idea. Just how do you actually get from idea to production work? Whether that's you know FTPing HTML files or this whole gigantic process, um, what we have definitely seen is um, it's way more difficult to add accessibility into a product after it's been launched. Obviously, the more complicated the product, the more difficult it's going to be, and it'll be kind of a, a, a confluence of multiple factors. Where uh, not only is it a very technically difficult uh, situation, um, but also you're trying to do it with the same culture or the same level of, of education that you may have had that that created that that code. Mm -hmm. So that's where um, having everyone do some education, some upskilling, um, some testing throughout the process, even if it's a tiny little bit, um, that really can amplify uh, the benefits that come down later on. Um, this is an area that at A360, we really kind of excel at as a third party company. We're the hardcore specialists that, um, you know, we can take something that has been um, built and help you integrate accessibility piece by piece. Um, but obviously there's a cost to that. There's time involved in that. Um, and there's a process to shift culture and whatnot. Um, so the, the best measure for, for all these sorts of things is preventative. Um, It'll cost you much, much less uh, in terms of labor, in terms of investment, auditing, et cetera, um, to integrate as much as you can all the way to the, the conceptual phase, the design phase, usability testing. Um, just have people think about this um, is a really good idea. See, so Jason, there's a question in the chat that fits really nicely into this whole uh, concept that you're talking about. And it's about accessible chat boxes. And the question says, we're working on accessible chat box. Can you please give some examples of chat box or live chats, which provide good experience for screen readers? There's a second part of that. My first quick answer to this is, yes, we can. We've done thousands and thousands of audits and a lot of the um, audits have been in retail where chat functionality is very common. So we'll speak to that. The second part of the question, Jason, is more technical one. Um, how to structure messaging in a way that they can be skipped as a section but also that they can be navigated one by one when needed. They are currently um, implemented as a group. Uh, we tried to make them a list uh, and so on. So on chat functionality, um, our stance is this, as an um, independent court certified auditing company, when a client hires us to do an audit, we don't typically do third party elements unless the client and that third party are in agreement. Um, it, if you think about it, the client's paying to audit something they can't fix anyway, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. A lot of times clients will have us audit it because the vendor has said it's fully accessible. And then they use us to test it to make sure it is or isn't. And then with those audit results, then we bring those teams together. Over the years, then we've developed a network of third party plugins and great you know, things to use and stuff we've audited and fixed through open source. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Jason for the and Nick for the technical part of it. But we certainly have um, uh, good recommendations on chat functionality. Um, we do issue letters of conformance on certain vendors, um, and we can take that offline or, or happy to share if you guys are comfortable with that. Go ahead, Jason and Nick, on the rest of the technical question. Sure, yeah, I was looking to answer that later on when we have time to get into some specifics. Um, this, this is a very advanced topic. Uh, there's really no standard way yet that uh, the industry has agreed upon to make an accessible chat widget, but we have looked at several of them. Um, 
the, the keys that I think I would point you towards, um, and there may be some follow-up as well, is the ARIA Live region um, is, is a technique that you're going to want to use. And the some of the most recent um, kind of research that I've been seeing on this is to use the, um, the I think it's the role of log. Um, and the idea is that it will it will keep track of the additions that have been made to that chunk of text and it will read out only the new stuff that gets uh, um, added. Um, but obviously there's there's also a lot more to it in terms of um, making it traversable, having all the controls make sense, um, having that, that dynamic real-time communication, like this person is typing or uh, et cetera. There's, there's different aspects to it. Um, but for that particular part of just making it announced to screen readers, I would recommend looking at um, the, uh, I have it actually up on a different screen, a, uh, the role of log, and I'll put that in the chat. I don't know, Nick, if you have any other observations from the wild. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. The, the role of log is going to be key to what Jason was saying, just making it so that you're just hearing the, the most recent message. Uh, and also like in your, you stated in your comment, the uh, verbosity, like if you feel like it's too verbose, it's too verbose for a screen reader user. So being able to navigate it in a way, um, like sometimes when you add in like a role of group for a message and all that, and then you have each message announcing individually, it just ends up being too much for a screen reader user. So, um, so yeah, I would definitely reach out to um, Michelle. We can, we can share some good examples of, yeah of ones that we have experienced in the wild. Uh, but yeah, the role of log will definitely help out. Um, and if you have the role of group anywhere on there, we typically steer people away from that because it just adds extra noise for a screen reader user. So. Oh, that's a great one. They asked specifically about that. Well, we can definitely keep questions to the end, Jason. I didn't want to um, interrupt kind of the flow of what we we're going through. Nick and I are just chatting on the side and we thought that would be a good one to work into there. So. Well, we can save uh, them. Just want to make sure that also we save enough time uh, to answer any of these Q and A's. So I think Jason will keep going and Nick, and then we'll work those in later. Does that sound good? Yep. Yeah, we just have a couple of slides and they're more more high level conceptual. And then we'll definitely have as much time as we possibly can for, for a Q and A. Uh, and we'll also plug you up with some, um, some links and emails so you can follow up with me or others with questions uh, as much as you would like as well. Great. Uh, for the SDLC, you know, we find that checklists are very popular, and I've provided some examples. Um, be very happy to share these out. If you just search for these, you might find them as well. Um, the A11Y project um, has an extremely uh, good checklist that I would probably recommend as my personal favorite. Um, uh, this is a, a fantastic one to go through. Uh, these definitely are, are popular with people that just want to, you know, do, do the basics, get things done. Um, and not be like full-time accessibility experts and specialists. They, they, they're, they're designers, they're developers. You wanna get some work done. Um, in more mature agile environments, you may have a concept of definition of done. So before something reaches production, it has to meet a certain um, you know, overarching set of success criteria. Um, so having things like conforms to the WCAG as, as part of the definition of done, uh, that can help so that while you're doing prototyping, there may be um, you know small bugs introduced here and there. You maybe get the the business logic all worked out, but there's at least a safeguard in the process where okay, if something goes to production, it needs to go through this full suite of of tests that may include accessibility, uh, just as a safety net. Um, and finally, obviously, like I said, working with uh, a third party uh, group like Accessible 360. Um, we live and breathe uh, accessibility and uh, code and design. Um, so sometimes just having even someone to just ask questions to, um, to, to get to bounce ideas for program improvements, like, hey, here's the curriculum that we want to have our testers learn about. We want them to be able to do this. Would this be good or bad? Um, or just have us do some of that testing uh, in partnership with your team that is really hyper focused on on accessibility um, it really depends on um, the company needs and, and maturity and all of that uh, 
a little specific thing that I wanted to put in that we see, you know, thinking about things to do that are really uh, impactful, very, uh, you know, wide reaching. If you use a CMS or you pr provide or you maintain a CMS, a content management system for, uh, you know, internal or external uh, users, um, that is a fantastic way to, to kind of shoehorn and guarantee a certain level of accessibility from the technical perspective. Um, we're seeing more and more CMSs and, and just content authoring tools um, provide kind of guardrails, um, link you up to documentation. Um, and there's even, uh, I was gonna show you over on Twitter. If you go onto Twitter now, there's more social media sites that um, not only do they support alt text, but they say, hey, do you not know what alt text is? Click here and you're gonna learn about it. So that's a fantastic way to kind of build in good practices and thoughtful thinking into the actual authoring environment. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing to have, have the feature supported, but having people understand how to do that um, can also be a challenge. So it's great to have documentation. Um, and these content management systems, you know, if you have image galleries, if you have these plug and play components, uh, forum builders, carousels, where they, you just say, hey, upload five images, we'll create that carousel for you. That's actually a fantastic opportunity for your development team to get a lot of return on the investment. So if you improve that template and you just spend you know, a week or two making that template phenomenal, then maybe you have found a way to make every form or every image gallery across your site uh, accessible. So there's a lot of great opportunity in, in thinking about your CMS that way. Uh, and then this is, I think, the final slide on kind of that technical side, uh, something that we just see so often. And Michelle, you've already uh, talked about this, and that's really awesome. It shows that this is you know, pervasive through everyone's mindset, uh, in our industry at least. Um, Third-party vendors that provide functionality that shows up on your website, um, whether that's a review section or comments or like live chats that we talked about. Um, it's, it's surprisingly uncommon for them to be taking accessibility maybe as seriously as you might or you have to, uh, depending on your situation. Um, but what I'm also seeing from the development side is, you know, maybe five, 10 years ago where everything was like a jQuery plugin and you can download it and hack it and you can make it your own. Many, many more tools now are trending towards, here's your iframe, here's your script tag, um, it does it all, and you don't have any control over the markup. And there's, you know, very clear benefits to that for security, for consistency, et cetera. But there's also a trade-off where if there are bugs that, that are being introduced by that company, um, if it's on your website, you're still going to be liable for it because that means people that use your website still can't do that, that thing that they want to do. And they're not going to necessarily care if it's your code or someone else's code, it's on your site, they, they want to use it. Um, we see this a lot with, with product reviews, e-commerce functionality, live chats is a good one, uh, and social media embeds. Um, and it's, it's, it's not uncommon, but also we do see this uh, often enough to comment on that um, the vendors are not always um, going to be super receptive <laughs> to, to just jumping on the bandwagon, prioritizing your needs um, and fixing accessibility issues. Um, so there will definitely be situations um, where you're going to have to negotiate or, or make a business call about what is the value of this functionality versus the risk of having it on the site and what are the pathways? Are they actually open to working with us? Um, and that's an area where um, practically uh, every week uh, I, I am involved with uh, clients that are thinking about or having friction or trying to figure out a tough third party functionality problem. Um, so the more that you can do yourself or kind of make a, de a decision about the importance of, um, the fewer third party vendors you have in that UI functionality space, um, the easier it's going to be for you to achieve and maintain accessibility. 
I'll add just a couple little comments here on that topic. Um, I'll start with the case law. So there was case law established in the Southern District of Florida from the Winn-Dixie case where that judge ruled that Winn-Dixie was 100% responsible for all third party vendors on their website. Keep in mind for Title III entities and, and what I'm referring to here is Title III of the ADA, types of organizations out there, uh, um, again, a little review from one of our last um, talks with the audience here, but there's two types of organizations out there in the United States. One where there are federal laws requiring you to meet um, specific accessibility requirements. Those organizations are the government, healthcare, and public education. The government by way of Section 508 Amendment to the Rehabilitation Act, healthcare and public education by way of the Amendment 504, grouped together, they call that, they have for years, Section 508 compliance. You're federally required to meet those. What Jason is saying about third-party content, absolutely um, would apply there. The whole entire thing needs to be uh, compliant. Title III organizations, those are places of public accommodation whereby the Americans with Disabilities Act in Title III prohibits discrimination in a place of public accommodation to a person based on a disability. Um, in that space, we're dealing with case law. And so what Jason was saying earlier about you're responsible and that type of thing, that's definitely more of an opinion. Um, if you're in the state of Florida and you're following that case law and your attorneys agree to it, then you're responsible for it. Um, but there's no federal law requiring you for it. And there's no requirement in the WCAG guidelines that speaks to the third party. When you're dealing with the third party vendor, I have this additional little piece of information. And that is there's three types of contract law generally. Uh, and one is called general. So when you get to doing your third party contracts and you're allowing a third party to come play on your real estate, right? You own this land and you're letting somebody else come into it and they're gonna put stuff up that's theirs that you don't have control over, but you're literally allowing them in and allowing them to do so. What Jason's saying is, is that you should have a corporate responsibility for that. And the way that you can leverage that in your agreements are number one, um, general. They're accountable for everything you're accountable for. That's a general contract clause. And you probably have that in a lot of them. Number two, you could have pass through, which is whatever were held accountable for, you as a vendor are held accountable for. And I'm just keeping these in real layman's terms. The third is specific. We um, strive to meet WCAG 2.1 level AA compliance. And we use, you know, and, and um, you as a vendor in our space, playing in our yard, you are specifically required to meet that too, by way of live user testing or a letter of conformance or something, whatever you put in there. So three different ways that you can accomplish that in your contracts. Um, case law for uh, Title III entities, places of public accommodation, retail, restaurants, stores, all that type of stuff required in um, the Title II entities. So I hope that clears that up just a smidge. Great, yes. Uh, and that is uh, actually the last slide for, for our, our practices. So we have plenty of time now for that AMA. And what I wanted to put in on this slide as well is as the developer advocate, I get to kind of be the uh, the front line of, of community engagement and answering questions on the technical and the uh, delivery side. So I'm on practically every Slack group. And um, if you would like to send me emails or questions uh, without any of the pressure of sales, <laughs> uh, but that's also what we need to have um, at certain times. So uh, I'm very happy to, to chat more if, if any other questions come up. Um, in nature. So looks like we do have a couple of questions already in the chat, right? Um, so we had um, Carolina's question. Uh, I hope we answered it a little bit uh, kind of on the fly there. And if we didn't or you have any other questions, definitely feel free to reach out or follow up. We'll probably have some time. Um, Maria, do you think we have some time to go through these other two? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and like I said, folks, if you have other questions, now's the time. Drop them either in the chat or the ask questions section. Um, let's start with Seth's question. If chat syncs to native mobile messaging, does that work? I think that was in reference to a previous mm -hmm. slide. Yeah, so that's really interesting. Let's, I'm kind of uh, thinking about that scenario. Let's say, okay, this this chat is doesn't have an accessible web interface. 
um, but it does send mobile notifications and maybe those go to SMS or email or push notifications, or maybe you do have a mobile app that is really great compared to the website. Um, would that be acceptable? That would be very tough. I think from a very kind of strict technical perspective, my intuition would be leading towards no, because it's you're saying, okay, you can't use this thing that everyone else can use. You have to have a mobile device. You have to do this, have a different way of doing things. Um, that's where it kind of goes into the strategic or tactical area. And maybe, Michelle, you have some thoughts about like, hey, this is something that um, is a little bit beyond like the WCAG. Maybe this is a strategic decision. Yeah, um, just trying to find my unmute. Oh, I had myself unmuted. Um, again, with anything um, that has to do with the compliance or your contracts with third party, I can't stress enough, bring your legal team back in and, and kind of have that reviewed. Um, if you're looking to network, right, like Jason said, um, Nick and I and he can can help you network with different providers and that type of thing. Um, uh, so I guess, you know, we can we can probably leave it, leave it right there. We don't want to um, we don't want to uh, you know, heavily weight something in, in one way or the other, but but happy to share what our personal experiences is because we want to be a resource, especially here in our local town um, and area to to help you guys find um, a path of least resistance forward for inclusion and accessibility. So happy to follow up. Yeah, from that kind of that nitty gritty, if I got this or Nick, you got this in an audit, um, just going from that intuition of like, where would where would that go in our, our process? Where would we start thinking about um, again, my, my intuition is that it would not, um, but it would need to be researched and need to be thought about and tested. And um, I don't believe I have seen that that work or been proposed before. Yeah, and kind of to piggyback a little bit is if it's not an equitable experience, ultimately you're forcing somebody to go in another direction, which is not, that's just, we typically will not accept that as a, you know, successful criteria. Yeah, the thought process behind that, if um, if I can impose myself to kind of bring, I don't want it to feel like a moral or a judgy type of response, but um, when, when you put a user through one digital door, uh, you put most people through one digital door, and then you have a, another digital door that based on a disability, you put other people through, that's where you need to stop and pause. And you need to ask yourself, why would you want to do that? Number one, I don't think in anything that we've ever done, Jason and Nick, there's a technical reason to do it. We have been involved in cases before where organizations, and again, a lot of this is in the past. People know better now, so they do better. Um, but lots of big companies um, did a special site for people with disabilities. They did a usable version. But there's been really huge federal rulings and stuff that that is not a good idea. From an operational standpoint, just keep in mind, you then have two of everything. How is it hard enough to keep one digital product updated on everything? You have to make sure that everything goes over there. Inevitably, the one that you created falls behind. You don't have enough time. Um, specific cases would be Scandinavian Airlines that did a separate but so-called equal general nutrition stores kind of went down the same route. It's um, It can be a bad PR move. So again, ask legal, think that through, and then just really understand what you're doing to a human. Yeah, that's, that's really, really insightful. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. sharing that. Um, all right, we have another question from Jessica. Hey, Jess. Um, the question is, when it comes to building accessibility into technology, I'm aware of website compatibility with web readers for the visually impaired. What other types of accessibility might uh, accessibility support might fall under this umbrella? That is a, that's a great question. Uh, the most impactful, the, the one that really comes up the most in, in kind of the real world scenarios which may actually be because it's possibly the most extreme scenario is the the native screen reader user, the the blind user. That's kind of the the farthest away from the, the visual medium of the web that people really think about. So it's it's it comes up quite a bit, and it's also just very um, you know very clear to most people what the gaps are. Um, what's interesting is that the the web content accessibility guidelines, the WCAG. Um, tries its best to capture as many different 
um, disabilities and needs as possible. So there's going to be almost an infinite spectrum of of different types of disabilities and combinations and different ways to accommodate and to work around those. But uh, surprisingly, if you are accommodating full keyboard support and full screen reader support, you're gonna be helping a lot of people. Um, Nick, I know you've also had a lot of discussions, I'm sure, around you know what, what do we need to think about in terms of supporting um, and, and what just happens naturally, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think looking at things from the, like you were saying, with the keyboard support to the uh, screen reader support, but also like kind of branching out, looking at your color contrast palette, ensuring that uh, things have proper color contrast, uh, that all users are able to toggle all elements. Um, that's going to go a long ways. And just also trying to look at things, you know, like, does your site have a visible focus indicator? You know, like, um, are there videos that start on page load, kind of like the MySpace days where things just <laughs> blow up in your face? And um, that's stuff that can stop somebody from using your site almost immediately. Um, mm -hmm. They'll just immediately close that or that tab and, and move on. So looking at those things through the user and trying to figure out, is this something that is just annoying or is this something that really would bother me um, if I had some type of uh, some type of impairment, so yeah. yeah, I was gonna this is Michelle. I was gonna throw a screen share up of a bunch of different types of assistive technology because Jess, I'm not sure if your question is coming from this angle. So what you mentioned, um, screen reader technology, obviously um, one of the most common uh, types of assistive technologies. That's what Jason said. Um, people that are not totally blind also use screen readers. Um, we use things like closed captioning. They can help um, with English as a second language, all that type of thing. But a couple of other examples that I had in my slide were um, an eye retinal mouse. So I can use a mouse. I can use a mouse tracker. I assume a lot of people on the call today can. Um, if you can't do that, you might use an eye retinal mouse if you're paralyzed, for example. That's another example of assistive technology. Um, you might use a refreshable braille display. You might use a sip and puff if you have, you know, severe paralysis and you can inhale and exhale. Um, you see these mounted on uh, some yeah. people's um, wheelchairs and things like that. But in order to interact with technology, there are simple switches, there are sip and puff, there's eye retinal mouse displays, there's different types of headsets. You might use a stylus in order to keyboard only navigation. And that's why it's so important to consider what Jason was talking about earlier with keyboard only. So that genre of assistive technologies um, what we teach organizations is that, you know, you, the work in accessible design and development is to make sure what you're building works across a myriad of all those different things, right? Um, again, JAWS and MBDA, two most popular screen reader uh, for desktops. On, um, on iPhones, it's going to be VoiceOver, and on Android, it's going to be TalkBack. Windows has a new one, right, Jason and Nick, called Narrator. doesn't have a big market share yet. JAWS and MBDA still have that, you know, part of it. But those are all the different mechanisms or apparatus, if you will, tech, uh, assistive technologies that people already have, and that's how they access what you're building. Hope that helps. Jessica just said, thank you, that's really helpful. And I didn't mean to close out of your slides. So if you, we do have time if you wanna show. Oh, anything. no, 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 it's, it was just a visual. Sometimes it's easier to like look at something versus listen to them, but I talk with my hands, I'm Italian, so it worked out fine. <laughs> you know, Melissa, uh, Michelle, something that just popped in my head as you were saying that is, I was thinking about that week hack and how we don't have to think about every single thing, but it's phenomenal. It's the more you know about these things, the more empathy you're gonna have. But from a technical perspective, not being paralyzed by all of these different possibilities oh, yeah. can help to understand that all of these technologies, and I'm also an electronics nerd, so I've built a few of these things for fun. I'm now thinking about that. You know, when I've built a sub and puff device or a, a, a switch-based interface, all of these things, including screen readers, on some level, they emulate, they mimic keyboard commands. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to you know, write special code that says, okay, listen for the sip and puff, listen for this. If you can support mouse and you can fully support keyboard, all of those fancy cool technologies, they're gonna be firing mouse and keyboard events. 
and your browser won't know the difference. So it's pretty nice. Great way to tie it together. It, yeah, people ask us a lot of questions like, well, you know, are you doing this and are you testing this and are you testing this and are you testing this? It's like, stop. We follow the guidelines which are written to enable success across all the different assistive technologies. And, and that's what Jason brings back. We had a coworker before that made a mouse, remember uh, Peter's uh, foot mouse? No, he was before my time, but oh, yeah. goodness. We, we had a coworker here at A360 in the early days who built um, a foot mouse and it was after he used a, a big like serving spoon where you could rest your heel in it, but then you could click through with your toes and moving it. It was phenomenal. It was really fun. So a nod to uh, your um, inventing side, Jason. Yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. That is awesome. Yeah, now is the time to throw any last questions you have in the chat. Um, I don't know if anyone was at, uh, we had a mini demo back to campus, actually the first one where we were at the U of M and it was actually co-hosted with, with Jess who's on here. But one of the student teams, they built a, um, a wheelchair for folks that have um, additional limited mobility. So instead of the, the blowing through the straw, it was a, a headset that got a chance to know the user's um, movement patterns and they would be able to direct the wheelchair just by moving their head in a certain direction. Oh, cool. Which was amazing. And it was a team of U of M students that did that. So Like a gaming. Yeah, like cool. a gaming toggle, right? Like a gaming mm -hmm. stick. Mm -hmm. we'll talk a little bit about that. Oh, I know. It's amazing. Well, um, I guess as, as we're kind of wrapping up, is there anything, you know, as we're, we're thinking about this, as we're thinking about kind of launching into 2021, Anything else that either of you want to want to cover or want to make sure that people walk away with? I will say one thing in summary. It goes back to a lot of the cliches or a lot of the well-established like uh, focuses and different things like that. But um, unless you put money behind inclusivity in your design and development, you have a wish. It becomes a goal when you put some gold behind it. And so you need a budget line item for this. And that's my gift. <laughs> Create a budget line item. If you don't have it now, start talking about it. Be an internal champion in your organization or clients' organizations. Because what I see um, a lot of times is people are like, oh yeah, it'd be great, we just can't afford it. I think we're getting to a point, and COVID's been a huge accelerator and a big awareness opportunity for equitable access at home. When COVID hit our company, for example, we prioritized grocery, banking, medical. We tried to make sure that we did what we could do in the pandemic to enable the better, you know, the most good across. You're getting to a tipping point where you cannot afford not to have a budget line item for this. So put some money behind this. Very well said. Um, Jason or Nick, anything you want to add? No, that's that's perfect. And, and obviously, you know, making that case, I've been in that situation many, many times, and it's very difficult, um, not just for accessibility, for, but for all kinds of DEI types of initiatives, any kind of bottom up work. But I definitely, you know, we can probably all feel that 2020, 2021, you know, it's, it's the beginning of a new kind of uh, cultural awareness, a new kind of imperative to to um, you know, invite inclusivity and equity and whatnot. So we're always available. Like I said, if you just want data or you want you know another person's perspective of how would I do this as you know a developer or a designer or whatever, um, we're all very happy to, to answer and have discussions. Yeah, put some money behind it and reach out for help. You know, you've got it. We have such a great network professionally and. Um, ideology wise and stuff here in the Twin Cities and we do a lot of work to help you guys do it. You're not alone. Don't suffer out there in silence. Reach out, get help. Tons of tons of people to to help you influence and, and share success stories. So um, thanks for your internal championship of it um, and your organizations and just showing up here and wanting to learn more about it and what you can do as we turn the page. Uh, on this new year, I think is really important. And I wanted to say thank you too um, to the organization for having us. This uh, was a really fun series that we did. And Jason and Nick, thanks again. Uh, nice to see you both because I don't see you in the office, but um, super great that you guys were here. And thank you to everybody who attended. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you to everyone who attended. Also, thank you to Accessible 360. This was an amazing series that we did. We really loved it. I know I learned a lot. So thank great. you so much. 
Um, and with that, we're gonna kind of wrap it up here. So there are um, many AMAs coming up. The next one is on the 27th, and that's about um, successful product teams. But as you heard me mention, mini demo back to campus, if you've never attended that before, we just launched it. We're doing another one in March. It's the same mini demo, geek show and tell, seven minutes to show off Minnesota made tech format. But all of the presenters are um, current students or recent graduates. And there's been some incredible tech showcased. If you are a student or recent graduate of any environment of education, boot camp, college, whatever, um, and you have something on. <laughs> We got a little bit of a glitch. She'll come back. She's asking you to join in. <laughs> no, no, what's and, and that you're totally welcome. Yeah. And that you exactly. can find more information on their website. Like somebody just asked about our previous sessions. Maria does have recordings to those. Um, and so if she doesn't make it back in on the glitch, that's what she was doing. Yeah. And those are precious sessions. So. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, precious and previous, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you everybody. I think we're safe to sign off. I hope everybody has an awesome rest of the afternoon um, and rest of January as we move forward into 2021. Thank you so much, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. See ya. Bye-bye. <laughs>